The question for us today is, what shall I do? Now, you may be different than me, but human beings develop patterns of behavior. Uh, we call them ruts sometimes. We go about our lives, whether we know it or not, in certain predetermined ways because we're used to doing things the way we did them. We have work patterns. When we go to work every day, many of us have a routine. We just kind of go through that routine and we're like rats in a maze and we do the same thing day after day after day. <clears throat> whether we know it or not, we have communication patterns. The way we communicate with the people we work with, uh, particularly the way we communicate with our families, husbands and wives, fathers and so uh, mothers and children, we get into patterns of the way we deal with each other. We're not even aware of them. Some of them are good, some of them are bad, some of them are healthy, some of them are not. We, we have thinking patterns, whether we're aware of it or not. <clears throat> we tend to think in certain ways and think about other people in certain ways and think about ourselves in certain ways. Some of these things are good and some of these things we're doing are not, but we get in these ruts. We have spending patterns. The way we handle our money and our resources, we have those patterns. But from time to time, all of us come to junctures in our life for one reason or another. It may be, you know, periodically that we're at the end of the year, kind of like we are here. <clears throat> or it may be that some great event happens in our life that shakes us up. It could be a good event. It could be a bad event. It could be a move. It could be a new job. It could be a death that occurs that shakes our world. It could certainly be a divorce. It could be a great illness which makes us reevaluate. It could be a family trauma which many of you have gone through or are going through. And so we're forced to stop for a minute and we evaluate the patterns of our life and we say, wait a minute, wait a minute. <clears throat> I need to look at this. I need to see what's going on and I need to ask a question. I need to ask the question, what shall I do? What shall I do now? What shall I do differently? What shall I do better? You know, our relationship with God is not distinct from these patterns of communication, and thinking and relationships and spending and work that we have it's really wrapped up in that stuff in 2 Corinthians 13 5 the Bible says examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith you know the prayer of AA is Lord uh, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change the courage to change the things that I can and the wisdom to know the difference. Self-examination is a good thing. And I hope this morning that you're open to it and you're willing to do it at this moment in your life. <clears throat> but self-examination is totally worthless unless it's followed with, by decisions and actions. Listen to me, church. I need to is completely worthless. I need to whatever it is. That's worthless. I'm going to is better, and even better is just exactly when and how and what I'm going to do in order to accomplish it. And if it's not followed by commitment and real action, then really it's fairly worthless. Different circumstances in life bring us to these turning points, both good and bad. Sometimes something really good happens to us, and it makes us stop and say, wow, I need to decide what I'm going to do. For example, <clears throat> in Luke chapter 12, J.B. read a moment ago, the rich fool asked this question. You know, he was a guy that had lived a selfish life. He had had everything he needed. He was very successful. He had a storage problem, and it, it came to a head, and he had to ask this question. In fact, in Luke chapter 12, verse 16, it says, and he told them this parable, that's Jesus, a couple of guys were arguing about their inheritance and they were about to fight with each other over what they were going to get. And Jesus said, you boys need to listen to a story. So he told them the story. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest and he thought to himself, what shall I do? Now see, every one of us in different ways needs to ask that question. You're in a particular place that maybe you need to do some evaluation. What shall I do? This guy said, I have no place to store my crops. My barns are full. I've got all these crops. They're overflowing. I've got to do something with them. It's a good problem to have, right? Did you realize that these moments, when we come to whatever crossroads it is we come to, are kind of dangerous moments? 
Because at those moments of decision, the whole course of the rest of our life can easily be determined. It's a huge moment when we come to those moments because we can do something really good or we can do something <clears throat> really bad. We can do something really altruistic or something really selfish. Sometimes we just get to a point in our life we say, this can't go on and we know we have to do something. Sometimes we get to a point in our life and we say, I can't take this anymore and we know that we have to do something. Or sometimes, like in this story, something really amazingly good happens and we say, wow, well, what am I going to do with this good thing? In verse 18, the guy said, this is what I'll do. So he made a decision. He could have decided to do nothing. That would have been dumb because some of his crops would have rotted on the ground and gotten wet and so forth. He could have decided, as he ended up doing, to build more storage. That's what he decided to do. He could have decided, though it's not even mentioned in the story, he could have decided to do something for somebody else. Maybe to help the poor farmer down the road or the people in the village that were starving or something like that. That's why these are such dangerous moments. But you notice when the selfish guy who had selfish patterns, and he probably didn't even think about them because he'd always been this way, he decided to do the same thing he'd always done and think of himself. Notice how in verse 19, he developed a rationale for that selfish decision. If you make a bad decision, don't you usually kind of develop a rationale to kind of justify why you make the bad decision? And so he developed this rationale in his own mind. How am I going to look at this? I'm deciding to do this. I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take it easy, eat, drink, and be merry. He's saying, I've got my security here. I'm deciding to rationalize this by saying I'm secure. I don't have to worry about anything. That's what I'm going to say to myself. And so everything is good and his life continues to be as selfish as it always has been. Verse 20, <clears throat> God said to him, You fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you're prepared for yourself? Do you realize that when God gives us stuff, and He gives us all stuff, this church is very blessed. All of us are blessed. God expects us to be responsible with what He gives us. He's going to ask us one day, What did you do with what I gave you? And so Jesus said to tell us what this parable means at the end. He said, this is how it will be for whoever stores up things for themselves and is not rich toward God. So, hey, I don't know where you are in your life. This may not even apply to you. I think it applies to some degree to all of us. But are you living a selfish life right now? Can you dare for a second to ask yourself that question? Am I living a selfish life? Are you rich toward God? Are you rich toward others? Will you be a more kind, benevolent, caring person this year on purpose? And if so, what are you going to do about it? What shall I do? There's another guy that asked this same question. The prodigal son. You know, pig pen kids. He asked this question. You know, sometimes in life, many of us have experienced this. We're just on a bad trajectory in our life. We've been going in a direction and we've just been doing it and it's, it's not good and it hadn't been good for a long time and it's just leading us down a road that's taken us further and further away from God and, and we have to come to the end of our rope. Maybe we have to do what some people call hitting rock bottom and whatever case that may seem and, and you know we seem to be treading water in our bad situation until finally we aren't. I thought of an incident that happened in my life. There was a friend of mine, Dave Carter, who used to drive a cherry red uh, Mustang Cobra. Some of y'all that are way back when know what I'm talking about. <coughs> Beautiful car and it would lay rubber like crazy and we'd tear around Denver in that car. <coughs> but Dave got grown up and he married and he had some little boys and they had a boat accident. And his dad was with him. Jack Carter was a great preacher, a friend of mine. I actually dated uh, Sherry Carter, the sister, for a little bit. But Dave went in the water. Dave was injured. Dave couldn't keep treading water. And uh, he drowned. And the two little grandsons. And the granddaddy was trying to tread water. And one of the grandsons was hanging on him. Both of the grandsons, I think, and as I remember uh, the story, I think one of the grandsons and the grandfather survived to get to the bank. 
But see, so the, the point of the story is, not that that just hit me in the head, but the point of the story is, this kid here, the kid in the pig pen, he was impulsive, he was selfish, he was wild. He took his inheritance, it was a dumb decision. He went off into a foreign country. He was just happily wasting, spending his money, uh, living with prostitutes and, and, I don't know, getting drunk, doing whatever he did. And it, it seemed like everything was going okay. It seemed like he was treading water just fine until he wasn't. Until he ran out of money all of a sudden, his daddy's money. And he'd never really had to work before, and so he hired out, the Bible says, in verse 15. He went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. I don't think this boy had ever worked like that. And I don't think this boy had ever worked for meager sustenance wages before. And I think he realized real soon how miserable he was, and he ended up in the pig pen, eating what the pigs were eating. Notice verse 16. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating. He longed. He was desiring. He realized he was in such a miserable state. He just longed to have a full belly. And I know he, he stopped himself in his life and he said, what has brought me here? How come I'm here? How come I'm hungry? How come I'm longing just to eat something this Meager. He longed, he wished, he desired something better. Are you at a point in your life where you long, you wish, you desire something better, something greater than the trajectory <clears throat> that you've been on? This boy asked him, he doesn't say it specifically, but I know he asked it in the pig pen. He said, what shall I do? What shall I do? He was totally in different circumstances than the rich fool, but he still asked this question, what shall I do? He thought about his father's workers. In verse 17, when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have enough food and to spare? He could probably think of some of them. He said, they're relatively happy. They've got plenty to eat. They're working for my father. What in the world am I doing here? You know, maybe your life patterns have been leading you away from the Father. Maybe they've been leading you further and further afield from the love of our Father. This young man came to his senses. Have you come to yours? It's obvious what I should do, he thought. Have you been isolated from other Christians? Have you been living sinful life knowing it's wrong? Have you been living empty relationships that are bad for you? Have you, do you have a meaningless trajectory in your life? What are you going to do? Verse 18, the boy made a decision. He said, I will set out and I will go back to my father and I will say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. What did we say about self-examination? What did we say about I need to? What if he'd sat in the pig pen and said, I need to get up and go to my father? How, how worthwhile is that? That's worth less. I need to is worthless. He said, I'm going to you. And if you look at the part in red, so he got up and went to his father. Assess, decide, and act on your decision. He got up and went. Church, beloved, friends, visitors, guests, are you thinking about what you need to do in your life? Do you need to do something different? Why don't you get up and return to your Father who will receive you with open arms if you'll do His will? Here comes one that's uncomfortable for all of us. Joseph asked the question. You know, Joseph, young Joseph, young Joseph had a great life, as great as it could be in ancient Canaan for a boy that was the son of a shepherd and a nomad. But he was his daddy's favorite son. Do you remember that? He had all these older brothers. His dad doted on him. His dad gave him a special coat of many colors that showed that he was the, the favored son. And in Genesis 37, he was bebopping along one day going out to visit his brothers. And his brothers who were jealous and resentful of him, they did something very bad. They grabbed him physically. They threw him into a dry well. You can think of a hole in the ground, a dry hole in the ground. They threw him down this hole and there he was, a prisoner in this hole, screaming, I need to get out of here. They didn't listen to him. They left him in this hole. Some of his brothers wanted to kill him, and I'm sure he heard that conversation. How would that make you feel? 
if that happened to you. Uh, some descendants of Ishmael, some Midianites came by. Now tell me what kind of men these were that came by and they sold their brother as a slave. Do you have any idea what that would be like? What happened to that boy when those Ishmaelites drug him up out of that well? <clears throat> what did they do to him? What kind of trauma did he go through? What kind of abuse did they heap upon that boy? What kind of an animal did they strap him to or drag him behind? What was it like being taken to Egypt as a slave? What was the humiliation like in his life? How was it like being sold by those bad men to Potiphar, the captain of the guard? His character earned him the trust. He was tempted by the wife. Did you realize that the boy was thrown into prison for two years? Now, we know prisons are no picnic today. But can you imagine what an Egyptian prison was like 1,700 years before Christ or whatever it was? Can you imagine what this boy went through for two years in that prison and how hurt he felt, how unjust he felt, how unfair he felt, how bitter he felt toward those brothers? Can you imagine? Some of you are sitting out there and you're saying, yes, I can imagine. Because I've had people that have hurt me I've had people that have been, been unfair to me. I've had people that have treated me with cruelty and injustice. And I know how this, this boy felt. Well, years went by. Do, do we sometimes carry feelings in our hearts for years? Do we sometimes carry hurt in our hearts for years? Do we sometimes carry bitterness deep down in our soul for years? Years went by and this boy advanced because of the hand of God to the second in command of all Egypt. And in Genesis 42, verses 6 and 7, the Bible says, Now Joseph was the governor of the land, the one who sold grain to all of its people. There was a great famine that took over the whole Middle East, and the only place there was food was in the Nile Delta of Egypt. And so the brothers had gone down. So when Joseph's brothers arrived, they bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. Now some of you that know your Bible... You remember the dreams that Joseph had as a young boy and how the sheaves bowed down to his sheaf? And now the fulfillment of that dream, these brothers, these mean, heartless brothers that threw him down that well and sold him for a slave, they're bowing down in front of him and he's got all the power. What shall I do? The rich man asked it, what shall I do? The kid in the pig pen asked it, what shall I do? And you can believe that Joseph, gritting his teeth, not being able to believe what he was seeing, bowing before him, he was fighting in his mind with that same question, what shall I do? And of course, he spoke harshly to them at that point, and he played around with them, and you remember the story, how they made these different trips back to their father, and they still didn't know what was going on, and he imprisoned one of them from time to time, and he did these different things, and he's going through all this hurt and this anger, and these emotions. <clears throat> Do you have those emotions in you over unsolved business in your life? All of us have people that hurt us in petty ways, sometimes in deep ways. Jacob put his, or Joseph put his brothers through the ringer. But in Genesis 45, sometime later, they came to Egypt again. And it says Joseph could no longer control himself before all of his attendants, and he cried out. See, that bitterness is not going to hurt the people we're bitter against. Do you realize that? The, the, the anger, the hurt, the bitterness, the resentment, the resentfulness, it's not going to hurt those people out there. It's going to hurt me. It's going to hurt you. And it was boiling up and trying to get out of him, and he could not hold it together anymore. He said, have everybody leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly, says the Bible, that the Egyptians heard him and Pharaoh's household heard about it. Throughout the palace, they could hear Joseph crying his eyes out. Why? Uh, I want to have a relationship with my family, he was forced to say. I want to forgive them. Even though I'm bitter, even though I've hurt, I want to forgive them. I want to move on. You got grudges, you got hurts, you got conflicts that are stunting your spiritual growth and your spiritual life and your happiness and your relationship with God. 
What are you going to do? What shall I do? You have to make a decision about what you will do. There's one more. David was forced to ask this question. Now, this is a little bit of a, a weird story. David made a lot of mistakes in his life. He sinned a lot in his life. <clears throat> you remember the Bathsheba thing? Everybody remembers that. The Uriah the Hittite thing, <clears throat> which we dismissed so easily. He had a man killed. David lied. He made all kinds of mistakes. But he repented of those, and he kept trying to go on with his life and do better like most of us do. And he made a lot of mistakes in his family. A lot of us make a lot of mistakes in our families. We've got to love each other and encourage each other through those things. One son raped one of his daughters. Remember this story? Another son killed the one that raped the daughter. So one son killed another son. Can you imagine the turmoil in that family? The young, handsome, politically astute son that killed his brother for raping his sister was banished by his father and father and son were estranged. He was brought back reluctantly by David to, to uh, Judah, but David said, you can bring him back into Jerusalem, but I don't want to see his face. Can you imagine the bitterness there that was going on? The young man was handsome. He was well-liked. He was politically astute. He was running around making friends, and before David knew it, there were thousands of men following his rebellious son and about to take away the kingdom. In fact, they threw David out of his palace. Do you remember the story of David going, leaving Jerusalem and Shimei throwing rocks and cussing him and, and David leaving with the tail between his legs and the, the whole country of Israel was about to burst open in a civil war. And it happened. There was war. And David's faithful commander, Joab, prosecuted that war. And you know, David said even to his soldiers who were dying for him by the thousands in that battle, he said, I don't care what you do, but don't hurt my son. But the son had caused all this trouble. And the son ended up with his long, beautiful hair hanging in a tree. And some soldier came and told Joab, he's hanging in a tree out there. And Joab said, and you didn't kill him? Joab said, give me some javelins and some men. And Joab who was the one who knew what had to be done, went and they hacked Absalom to death. And David said, Oh, Absalom, my son, my son, my son, Absalom, would that I had died instead of you. Well, David sunk into a funk. Think about this. Thousands of men had gone into battle. Thousands of men had died to bring down this rebellion, to keep David's kingdom for him. And David sunk into a funk and retired from them. I think he probably wrote Psalm 3, Psalm 69, and Psalm 22 during this period of his life. But in 2 Samuel 19, verses 1 and 2, this went on for a while, and, and uh, Joab knew something had to be done. Joab was told the king is weeping and mourning for Absalom. We can see that, certainly. And for the whole army, he said, the victory that day was turned into mourning. For the troops heard it and said, the king is grieving for his son. Now look at the last part of that. The men, that's those thousands of men that had fought this great battle. They stole into the city that day like men who are ashamed as they flee from battle. Verse 5. Then Joab went into the house to the king and said, today... You have humiliated all of your men who have just saved your life and the life of your sons and daughters. You have made it clear today that the commanders and their men mean nothing to you. But David was lying there, bawling his eyes out, and who knows how many days this went on, and David was in a funk. Now, I'm, very, I'm going to be very careful when I say this. I do not denigrate or deny or disparage the reality of, of times in our lives that, that we go into deep sadness because uh, of circumstances in our life, sometimes because of chemical imbalances we have. I understand all that. Elijah was kind of like this. When he went into that cave, you know, and laid down and said, I'm the only one left and I've tried as hard as I can and nobody wants to worship God and 
he hid out in the cave. David was hiding out in his room. But you know, we can get into a pattern. We can get into patterns of isolation. We can get into patterns of doing nothing. We can get into patterns of hiding from the world. We can get into patterns of, of whatever. And, and maybe we need a Joab. I don't know. What shall we do when those times come in our life? Notice 2 Samuel 19, verse 5. You know, God told Elijah in the cave, you need to get up and go back and I've got work for you to do. Here Joab said, now go out and encourage your men. I swear by the Lord that if you don't go out, not a man will be left unto you by nightfall. Your entire army will desert you if you don't get up from there and go do what you're supposed to do as the king of Israel. Now again, I get it. Life knocks us down sometimes. It knocks the wind out of it. It, it, it just takes us down to our roots. But sooner or later, after life knocks us to our knees, sooner or later we've got to come to a point where we ask that question. What shall I do? Shall I just lay here and die? Or shall I get up and shall I do something that's good and encouraging and positive and go on with my life in a way that's going to glorify the Father who is in heaven? What shall I do? You know, we've all got patterns. Go to that last one there, brother. Uh, uh, Jeff, by the way, the king got up and went in the gateway and encouraged his men and that's what he should have done. We've got patterns in our life. When I walk into this building, I've got a little traced path that I go and I just go and I don't even think about it and, and I'm going to have to make some adjustments on that and that's good. Okay? What shall I do? We've got resources, the way we use them, we have patterns, we've got a relationship or lack of it with God, we're in our patterns. We've got relationships with people, maybe problems, grudges, hurts. What are we going to do with those? Our thinking patterns. What are we going to do with those? Some of you need to ask the question this morning, what am I going to do? Am I going to obey the gospel of Christ or not? Am I going to get closer to God like I really need to or am I going to keep going like I have this last year? Am I going to do good or am I just going to be selfish? Am I going to encourage other people or not? Am I going to serve or am I not? What shall I do? Hey, this lesson's for me. This lesson's for you. I don't know where you are, but you do. If we can help you do the will of God, please come as we stand together and as we sing.